video is the only, and now we're live. So then I usually do this. I have no idea what to turn off. Turn on again. Right, yeah, I know. And it's like, it's like, okay, I should have been. But I didn't. So, okay. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. And, you know, both my sons live out of the state. You know, it's like, I'm I do bother my daughter so much. Hey, you know how to do this. But you know, a lot of different things, you know, in houses, it's different. Yeah, yeah. It's not I forgot the same. my book. Oh, no. Nope. I don't know. And it's, you know, I'm like, the kids are going, well, you're going to sell your house. I don't know. This is my house. This is my home. I said, I told him, I said, I'm sitting on my house. There is nowhere else in town that can cost this amount, you know? Hey, how are you doing? I am good. I want to tell you, you have performed a wonderful service for my sister. <laughs> you never talk good about morning. You know? morning. You helped her out. Welcome to worship this morning. Okay, I'm sitting. Beautiful day. It's uh, Father's Day. I'd like to... Raise your hand if you are a father, right? Or if you have a father. <laughs> or if you did have a father at one time. All right. Well, congratulations. I think I've learned more about life by being a dad than just about anything. Same for you. You learn from your mistakes, so I don't know what that says about me as a parent, but I think my kids might agree. My uh, mom is with us today, my friend Brian, he drove her over from Stillwater, Minnesota. Wow. Thank you guys for coming and being here on Father's Day. Um, got a couple of announcements. Next week is our, next weekend is our church picnic. A good, old, fun, old-fashioned family picnic. We're going to be at Bretner Park, which is just down this way, a couple blocks. And the church is picking up and providing grilled meat. And you can provide something to go with that, a side, or you could bring a bag of chips. If you're not a good cook, just bring a bag of chips. <laughs> All right. Any other announcements? Oh, our community garden has uh, got a lot of plants in it. Uh, thank you, special thank you to a local business called Plantland, who donated quite a bit of uh, tomato plants and other plants so that we can do the work of growing them and then giving the food to Project Concern. If you would like to help out, if you're good at weeding a garden or watering or tending, you'd like to be part of the group, you can sign up for a rotation to come and uh, look after the garden. At the very least, you're going to want to walk by there and ooh and ah on your way home today if you haven't already done that. And then we are ready for our prelude. Yes. Oh, we still need a bingo caller for the picnic. And a bingo game, apparently. Oh. And prizes. So we've got it all covered. <laughs> if you would like to call bingo, talk to my wife. If you have a bingo game, talk to my wife. If you have prizes, just bring them and put them in the sacristy. There's a box there for bingo prizes. I spent a summer calling bingo at the nursing home. So maybe I can't find anybody else. And we had all these prizes that were donated. And I realized one day how the prizes would get donated. People die. And all the prizes they had won in bingo get recycled back to the front table. 
So if you didn't win it this time, who knows? All right. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship on this Father's Day as we listen to uh, a prelude by uh, Emily entitled Children of the Heavenly Father.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Blessed Yahweh, you claim us as your beloved people and exhort us to live out our love for you. Teach us to honor and obey you, our one and only God, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Exodus. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after reading this, I realize I probably shouldn't be giving a sermon today. It's a Sabbath. Good thing it doesn't really feel like work to me to do this. This is kind of what I would do for fun, even. There was a line in here that kind of sparked my attention. Did you, did you notice it? Uh, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children. Can you believe that? I thought, well, I'll just skip over that. Maybe no one will have noticed it, and we'll just move on. And I can tell you everything I know about the commandments. But I'm not likely to do that. Is God a jealous God? That's the question we have today. I think how we perceive God matters. For people at the time the commandments were written, they had an understanding of God that they inherited from neighboring peoples, and those gods were to be feared. They were jealous. If you gave your allegiance to some other god, they would find a way to punish you, or at least that's how it would feel and look. And so the writer who tells us the first part, which is God is jealous and punishes to the third and fourth generation. They already knew that. That was not surprising. Wouldn't even have, they wouldn't even have thought that was unusual. But then he says, but God blesses to the thousandth generation. God's steadfast love endures to the thousandth generation for those who love and fear God and God's commandments. 
I was reading an article in a, a per periodical called Scientific American. I don't read that periodical as a regular. But I found an article, it was emailed to me, um, and the, the title of the article is Trauma in the Family Tree, kind of what we're talking about here. And so I read the article and I was fascinated that there was a, a researcher and at the time of 9-11 living in New York City, they decided to open up a clinic where any women who were pregnant, who were part of the trauma of 9-11, so if they worked in an office building near the trade centers, or even if they worked there, or they were part of breathing in the foul smoke, or if they knew someone, if you felt like you were traumatized by that day, you could come and get free medical care and as a part of that, they wanted to know um, what kind of an effect it would have on your baby. One of the things they realized right off the bat is that across the board, the women who had been experiencing trauma had an average lower birth weight of their baby. And a lot of the other app scores that they test for, which is how well your baby is thriving, and that doesn't seem too unusual. I guess I could have predicted that. I mean, that's probably why they did the study. They thought that was going to be true. But what they didn't realize is that they came back and they tested a bunch of those kids years later when they were uh, preteens and realized that they had lasting effects. They had a lower level of cortisol, a stress uh, a hormone that helps you to deal with stress. And that made them less able to deal with stress in their own lives. It'd be interesting to see if you tested their kids someday. And maybe they will. Maybe they'll write another article. But what I didn't see coming was that these same women giving birth seven, ten years later their children were low birth rate, weren't even around. They weren't in utero during this catastrophe. But the trauma that the women experienced years later was still passed on in the form of low levels of cortisol in their children. The article goes on to say that men have an influence as well. Uh, they wanted to know if men were traumatized, would their children also have the effects of that? They had, didn't have some study they could do over the course of 10 years, so they went and they got a bunch of mice in a laboratory, and they did this thing to a mouse where he would smell a cherry blossom and find his way through a maze to the cherry blossom, and when he got there, and he got right up to it, it would shock the mouse. Sounds kind of cruel, doesn't it? Guess what happened? When those mice gave birth, their offspring would not go toward the smell of a cherry blossom. They would run away from the smell of a cherry blossom. And because mice, you know, they procreate, you don't have to wait 10 years, what they found is that each subsequent generation of these mice had an aversion to cherry blossom a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. Is it possible that at the time the scriptures were written and people lived in large family units, they, they lived, you know, grandparents and parents and kids and, you know, out of necessity, that they could see the effects of people's bad decisions on their kids and grandkids. And they knew that firsthand that that was true. And that people can only think or believe about God what they think or believe about God, what they've experienced. If you have a loving father, chances are you have an easier time trusting if you had a father who was always gone, maybe you under, 
believe God to be someone who is just out there and kind of abandoning. But we can relearn this. The article went on to talk about men with PTSD from Vietnam. And some of the studies, well, they found that they had in their children lower cortisol levels than in themselves. But if they spent time with a loving partner or in a loving home, a loving atmosphere, a nurturing environment at work, uh, if they went to psychotherapy and counseling, they would overcome this PTSD in a way that also was passed on to their children. It's not just the negative things. But when we care and love our children, we are also caring and loving our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. That is the science. I could explain it to you, but I don't know what it is. I read it. If you want the article, uh, I'll give you a link to it. But the good news is that even though in this section of scripture written by people a long time ago who didn't have much of a concept of God, we have the ability, we have the whole scriptures, we have pictures of Jesus who came to show us who God is, who was very loving. And in fact, instead of calling God a jealous God, he called God Father, Abba, Daddy. And it opens up for us a different kind of relationship. Not a relationship based on rules, uh, afraid to fear, uh, to, to disappoint, but a relationship of love and nurture and care. A, a, a relationship of connecting. We all have trauma in our past to one level or another. You can't get through this life without experiencing some terrible things. Sometimes they're self-inflicted. But having somebody who loves you, who can help you see yourself differently, who can help you reinterpret the hurt that you have and to trade it for the fullness, the love that... And God is waiting to do that, waiting to fill those empty spaces in your life with God's love through God's Holy Spirit. And then God calls us as we become whole to do that for others, to reach out, to see us as that driving force of love in the world. On this Father's Day, I wish you all love. A love that passes all understanding, that heals your hurts, and makes you whole so that you can love. Amen.
Let us profess our faith with the words of the Spirit of Peace Creed. We believe in God the Creator, whose love is the life force of the universe, who believes in us, trusts us, and empowers us, who lives in us and through us and fills us with wonder. We believe in Jesus, God's own Son, who shows through his life the heart and character of God, who lived to raise up the lowly and to bring peace to all people, who loved those unloved, fed those who hungered, healed those with sickness, who taught adults and laughed with children, who was crucified for seeking truth to power, who was raised by God to live forever and to inspire us to truly live, we believe in God's Spirit, who brings the mystery of God into our hearts, who guides us through a familiar whisper of truth, who sparks our creative passions, who comes to us in the bread and the wine, who gathers all children of earth into one family, who uses our abilities and gifts, who sends us out to be the good news. God of love, we confess that sometimes we try too hard to live lives that are not ours, to try to be other than who you created us to be. The hurts of our past show up in our present and turn us inward, inspire us to open ourselves up to your loving mission in the world. Give us courage when we are fearful. Give us grace to love ourselves use our gifts to transform our lives into the loving example of your son forgive us renew us and lead us back to the best of who you have made us to be god lives in you in and through you and promises to walk with you on this day and the days to come we have been created by god and called by god to live in harmony with god our neighbors and our world may peace and joy be with you always and also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. To pass the peace together, if you would like to shake a hand, stand up and put your hand out. If you would like a chicken wing, you put your chicken wing out. If you don't want anyone in your space, and you just want to give them one of these, you can do that and just remain seated. And if you're too lazy and you just want to watch, you can do that as well. <laughs>
God of Sabbath rest, we offer these the fruits of our labors, that others may receive all that is needed. Bless our gifts to the glory of your holy name. and our joy to give thanks and praise to our God who has created our world and all that is in it, who has loved us from the beginning of time and who lo whose love sustains us in our every breath. Let us join in the never-ending song of all creation. this in remembrance of me. And after supper he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us join our hearts and our hands and our voices as we pray the prayer of Jesus.
the body of Christ given for you. Jesus Christ, heal our brokenness, free us from fear, and fill you with love. May this love overflow into all the world. Amen. I asked Ginny if she would sing one verse of Children of the Heavenly Father in Swedish. Unless anybody else knows it, you can come and sing with her, but she's going to do that now. I didn't ask her ahead of time, I just asked her now. <laughs> Well, here we have the Swedish soprano. <laughs>
to God.